I'm Jim Mullins. I'm the Dean of Libraries here at Purdue. And I really, really um, am looking forward to this evening. We have a three-prong approach tonight for this event. First, I'm sure that many of you have already seen the exhibit. But if you haven't, please stop in and see that exhibit. It's been, it, it was transformed in the matter of, what, a day? Sammy? Approximately. A day. Um, previously, it was on roads. Tonight, it's on a different subject. So it's one that we all should be able to enjoy. Second, we have a new book that we're celebrating, The Dean's Bible, Five Purdue Women and Their Quest for Equality. And third, we have the naming of the recipient of the 2014 award for an outstanding contribution to the Women's Archives. A remarkable evening if we had just one of these, but we have all three. A very special evening. So to keep this evening moving, and since many of you know me quite well, know that I could actually stand up here and talk for at least the next hour, um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Sammy Morris, the University Archivist, Head of the Division of Archives and Special Collections, and Director of the Virginia Kelly Carnes Research Center. Thank you, Jim, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. I was just talking with Betty and Angie earlier about how long this has been coming and how much work has gone into it and how much excitement we have to kind of finally see the book and the exhibit in place. Um, I want to tell you very quickly that this is the eight-year anniversary or birthday of the Susan Bulkley Butler Women's Archives. And I think it has, at this point, reached a level of maturity that we can be very proud of. And that's the th to um, the credit of many people, two of whom are in the audience today, who have supported this from the very beginnings, Betty Nelson, Dean of Students Emerita, and Captain Sally Watlington, Distinguished Alumna. So it seems very fitting to me that as part of the launch of the Dean's Bible publication and the Quest for Equality exhibit, that we recognize not only the contributions they've made to Purdue, but also the specific roles they've played in serving as advocates for the women's archives. The archives is really here to tell the story of the women who have made contributions to our past. And this exhibit, I think, shows a particular part of our past that's very compelling because it has touched on the lives of so many students. It draws upon collections that allow us to see the actual evidence of the impact that these women have made on our university. Starting with Emma McRae, who was a champion for women's education in the 19th century, and she believed strongly that an educated woman could make the world a better place. She was a mentor for Carolyn Shoemaker, who was our first part-time dean of women. And Carolyn made major contributions to our history that you might not even know about if you just relied on some of the standard history books about Purdue. She did things like growing our alumni association into a successful entity. She founded the mortarboard chapter at Purdue, and she helped raise funds to build the memorial union. Yet there's very little about Carolyn Shoemaker that's still in existence today. And that's one reason the Women's Archives was needed. Just as Carolyn mentored her successor, Dorothy Stratton, each of these women in their legacy chain mentored the other. And this has been a theme that we have seen throughout the exhibit, throughout the communications with these amazing women, that they believe very strongly in giving back to other women as well as other people of all kinds. So the exhibit today charts the course from Emma McRae to, to Carolyn Shoemaker to Dorothy Stratton, our first full-time Dean of Women, who joined us at a time when women's students' enrollment was rapidly increasing. And frankly, the people at Purdue had no idea to, to, what to do with all these women's students. <laughs> and if you read Angie Klink's book, you'll see that they really felt that they needed to bring in some woman to wrangle these women and get them under control. <laughs> so Dorothy created things like the career placement service for the women's students. She helped establish a pioneering, ahead of its time, liberal sciences program at a time when most of the women at Purdue were encouraged to go through home economics. And that served as a precursor for what now or later became the College of Liberal Arts. She went on to establish the Women's Reserve of the US Coast Guard. And she mentored her, her successor, Helen Schliemann, who went on to abolish curfews for the women's students at Purdue. Helen fought for women's rights 
during her entire career and even after. After retirement, whenever the presidency for Purdue position became open, she wrote a letter to the administration with names of 10 qualified women she was suggesting be considered for that role. Um, of course, we would not go on to have our first woman president until more recently, but Helen was never afraid to share her opinions, and that's one of the things I admire about these women the most. They all are able to um, take a stand for what they believe in in a very professional and collegial way. So as Helen was mentored, she too mentored her successor, Beverly Stone, who counseled the students during the civil rights era on campus and was responsible for making sure that students had representation and voices in faculty committees and in the Board of Trustees minute, meetings. meetings. Mm -hmm. And then when the deans of women's office and dean of men's office were merged, Beverly Stone was named the first dean of students and at that time became the first woman in the Big Ten to hold that title. So Beverly, in turn, mentored her successor, Barbara Cook, the next link in the chain of the deans of students. And Barbara was another woman who was so committed to diversity and rights for all people that even well before the Brown versus Board of Education, she wrote her master's thesis on problems of racial segregation in schools. Barb served as an incredible role model for the Purdue students here who went on to name the Mortar Board chapter in her honor. Barbara then mentored her successor, Betty Nelson, who worked tirelessly on behalf of disabled students at Purdue, started the Disability Resource Center, and founded the Student Leadership Development Program. She's also contributed in many ways uh, to the members of the community through her leadership roles on nonprofit organizations. All of these women deans not only made a major con contribution through founding of new buildings and policies and programs, but they have continued to impact all of the lives that they touched while they were here, and all of the students who in turn have felt inspired by them to continue to give back to their communities. Two of those students, Sally Watlington and Mary Lou McEwen, Mary Lou McEwen are here tonight and also are part of our exhibit and celebration. So the ripples that these women deans started have spread throughout their mentoring for each other and every student since. And in this way, they've helped fulfill a dream that Emma McRae had from the very beginning, which is that if you educate women and if you educate people to come together and work together, they can help each other and they can make the world a better place. So I want to at this time recognize the amazing contributions that the curators of this exhibit have made. Uh, the France Cordova Women's Archivist, Stephanie Schmitz, was the chief curator for the exhibit. I, she's probably hiding somewhere. And her graduate assistant, Johnny McDon McConnell, also was curator of the exhibit. And I just want to recognize their efforts. And now it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Charles Watkinson, who is the director of the Purdue University Press. Thank you, Sammy. <clears throat> so I'm very excited this evening to uh, see just hot from the printer the, the fruits of um, over a year of efforts by um, especially our um, author here today, Angie Klink. Um, the Purdue University Press is dedicated mostly to academic publishing. Uh, we publish the work of authors um, at the university and beyond in areas like engineering education and uh, technology and select areas in the humanities and social sciences. But um, the fun part of our job really is working on the regional history of Indiana and the history of Purdue. And uh, Angie has been a wonderful partner for us over the last few years, writing several wonderful books that have introduced me as a native Hoosier, as you can tell, uh, <laughs> to, um, to, the, to the community um, that I'm proud to call home. And this uh, book, The Dean's Bible, is really, uh, I think, an apotheosis. Um, it's, 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 a, it's really the, the, the height of um, Angie's accomplishments so far um, as a writer and historian. Um, I hope you'll have a chance to experience this book yourself. And I'm contractually obliged to tell you it is for sale. <laughs> it's just at the back of the room. It's only $20. And um, Angie is available to sign 
um, after the event. And I hope you'll also pick up a copy of our new catalogue, again hot off the press, which will introduce you to some other elements of our list. So now I'm very excited to introduce you to um, an environment which may have been scary for some people. You may even recognize it, some of you in the audience. It is the Dean's Office. <laughs> and this is the Dean's Office somewhere between the 1960s and 1990s. And I can see Betty is already bristling at the idea of scary. I, I, I know, I, I know, I, absolutely, I, I totally acknowledge this, Betty. Anyhow, um, but you will see this environment now populated um, by two people. Um, Dean of Students Emerita, Betty Nelson, familiar to, I think, everybody in this room, and the naughtiest student who ever attended <laughs> Purdue. In fact, a student who was so bad that uh, the deans actually had to change over to deal with her. You had to have two deans. Um, uh, Angie bridged the gap between Dean Stone and Dean Cook because she, she, she was too much for one, one dean to deal with. <laughs> But anyhow, um, if I could invite up now to the podium, um, welcome to the Dean's office, uh, Angie Klink and Dean Betty Nelson. <sighs> Thank Wouldn't you, have Charles. to have a counseling session <laughs> with him. Uh, I knew he was a Hoosier. I just knew that. Um, thank you, Charles. Um, I want to thank all of the staff of Purdue University Press for creating such a lovely book. Um, thank you to editor Catherine Purple. Where are you, Catherine? Are you hiding someplace? Uh, this is the third book uh, that Catherine has superbly edited for me, and I'm very grateful. And uh, it's a pleasure to work with Catherine, and I think we make a good team. And thank you to Brian Schaefer uh, for production and promotion of the book. Uh, the beautiful dust jacket, uh, interior gold paper. If you already have your book, you can look along with me. Uh, and the creme de la creme is the foil stamped hard cover. If you take the dust jacket off and look at the front, uh, the gold lettering, I think that is, it's very elegant and it really suits the dean. So I'm thankful for that. And thank you to Charles Watkinson, I think, uh, <coughs> director of Purdue University Press who skillfully guided every aspect from book proposal to book release today. So, um, so welcome to the office of the dean, I think, of dean of women. Uh, tonight, this room and the archival exhibit next door are filled with symbolism, uh, threads of connection, artifacts from five stellar leaders of Purdue University, Dorothy C. Stratton, Helen B. Schliemann, Beverly Stone, Barbara I. Cook, and Betty M. Nelson. I'm not gonna let you talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Betty and I will be highlighting many of those symbols that encircle us here tonight as we chat here in the Dean's office. Each member of this connected quintet was courageous in speaking out for students, for women with, uh, and for those with disabilities, for those who were quote unquote different. Each dean during her tenure was often the lone female voice in a male-dominated administration. From the 1930s until the 1990s and still today, these women were advocates for students. They were our feminists, humanists, women with high integrity, class, and moxie. Do you think Betty has moxie? <laughs> oh, I think that's a yes. Okay. I call your attention to the cover, and if you have your own book, you can look at it, but um, a good friend and colleague of mine, she couldn't be here tonight, but Natalie Powell designed the cover, and uh, she uh, artistically used a vintage jacket that I have as that plaid that you see behind the deans is an actual jacket I have that's like from the 50s or 60s. She wanted to uh, reflect on what the women would have worn during that time, rather mad men looking. And then at the top and, and inside the dust jacket, you'll see the photos from inside the Bible where um, the dean signed when each time that they passed it on to the next dean, they signed their name and dated it and put a favorite passage down. So you can see that subtly in the uh, cover. So the photos of the Bible were taken by my son, Jack Clink, who's here tonight. He, and he's a Purdue student in film and video studies. So Betty, 
Could you tell us about the wonderful photo on the cover of the Dean's Bible? I would be happy to do that. Is there anybody in the room who has not seen this picture somewhere? <laughs> it, it is probably the most ubiquitous picture out of the Purdue files. You know, who would have guessed? A, a little bit of background on that. Uh, I, I became dean uh, July 1, 1987. And I wrote in my journal about that time, the first two weeks, I was absolutely terrified. The next two weeks, I was just scared. Well, I think it was during the scared period <laughs> that Barb Cook called and invited me to come over to their house at 1807 and have lunch. And I thought that was the kindest thing in the world, to you know, give me a, a time out, a safe place to be for lunch. And Barb said, and I think we'll have celestial chicken salad. Well, I knew. It had to be a very special event if Barb was going to fix her mother's recipe for celestial chicken salad. I mean, that was the premier dish. And she said, and by the way, we may invite Dorothy and Helen to come for lunch also. And they just lived one block down the street. So that sounded like a really fine, fine lunch. Beautiful day. I drove over there, walked in. Celestial chicken salad was on the table. Indeed, Dorothy and Helen were there to share lunch with the other, with the four. Bev, Barb, Helen, Dorothy, and I. So we ate our wonderful chicken salad, good as ever. And for dessert, we had uh, Beverly's favorite key lime pie. And I think you had little samples of both the chicken salad and the key lime pie in the refreshment room. Finished the dessert, and Barb handed me this worn, ragged Bible, leather bound. I had never heard anything about this Bible. And then they started telling me the story. Carolyn Shoemaker died. Somebody cleaned out her desk. When Dorothy came as Dean of Women, she inherited that desk. Dorothy, setting up her office, found in the back of one of the drawers this Bible that had belonged to Carolyn Shoemaker. So Dorothy held on to that Bible. When she left the Dean of Women's position and Helen Schleeman took over, Dorothy put her favorite Bible verses in that book, signed it, and passed it on to Helen. Helen did the same thing, eventually passed it on to Bev Stone with her favorite Bible verses in it. It went from Bev to Barb to that day in 87 when the Bible was passed to me. I was astounded. Knock at the door, bell rang, in came Dave Umbarger, the university's senior photographer. Somebody had thought to invite him over. Brilliant. You know, one time when we were all alive. <laughs> and you just never know about those things. So Dave was there to take a picture of the five of us. You know, this line of deans that started in 1933. No place else in the country was there a legacy like that. Dave, being a very creative soul, said, uh, why don't we just go out on the golf course, which was about 15 steps outside the house. He said, you all line up, walk toward me, and, and I'll just take pictures, which is exactly what he did. And that's what you see in this picture of the five deans walking. We just marched right along, all lined up, behaving very well, and... <laughs> Those are the pictures that came from that. And you'll notice that Dorothy is just a little bit aside from the rest of us. And I think that was Dorothy Stratton's. Um, that was her approach to life. Dave said some years after that that this was the most requested picture he had of all the picture work he had taken at Purdue. Why that is, it is certainly unique and we're proud to be part of that. So, Angie, that's my story. 
And you're sticking to it, I think. Sticking to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you want to explain next the significance of these two photos and our mm. books on the table. Some of you have probably seen these pictures also, but this is a picture, 1968. Beverly had just been appointed Dean of Women. And, you know, boy, this reflects on the old days. Do you remember the Welcome to Purdue Journal Courier? That big, fat edition of the newspaper that would come. Well, included in that was part of that Welcome to Purdue was something from the Office of the Dean of Women and something from the Office of the Dean of Men. But this is the picture that was taken by the Journal Courier photographer. And Bev had us all come line up very dutifully here. And Helen has just retired. Helen is ready to start her two-year stint as director of Span Plan. So this is Journal Courier. Um, this is Miss Stone's picture down here. So real treasure. Then come 1989, I'm Dean. We're getting ready to move to Schliemann Hall. And this is the last weekend that we are in the offices in Hufti. And it's, you know, being involved in people, in traditions, it seemed to me we just had to invite the same people back to have brunch that last Saturday. So this is the 21 years later iteration of that Journal Courier picture. Uh, the only one who isn't here is Nancy Friedersdorf, who had moved to Arizona. She'd retired. So we just plugged in Dorothy Stratton there and <laughs> took, care, <laughs> took care of that hole right away. Uh, the graduate intern is missing, but you know we have Dorothy preserved here. So one day, and, and here in the corner, you'll notice who brought this picture. So it's included in this photograph as well. And one day, my frame with these two pictures in it will come to the archives, but just not ready to give that up just yet. But I treasure those, and I think that is such a good example of the kind of feeling that was generated uh, by the staff. Um, the, the, the books that are here, you may want to take a look at those before you leave. Every one of those you will find referenced in Angie's book. Um, they all have a relevance, whether it's The Velveteen Rabbit or um, Best Foot Forward or Ellen Goodman. You know, they all, I think you can see something about the variety of interests and contacts that the staff had just by looking at that collection uh, uh, of books. Um, the, uh, Forrest Gump, you'll notice, and, and that's related to, that's to um, Dorothy. Some heated something was going on in the office, and I was so stressed out and you know, thought life would, was soon going to be over. And I had this little note from Dorothy who, who said, you know, we've all been there. This is the way it is. And why don't you just go see Forrest Gump? <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the level of support we had from that collection of, of mentors and colleagues. Just exceptional. I will stop. Now, Angie, how did okay. you learn about the Dean's Bible? Since it was a secret and we didn't share that with anybody, how did you sneak in and get it? Don't you want to know? I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, every time I attended a Purdue women's event, a lot of times up here, I would see that photograph. And I didn't know the women. They were standing shoulder to shoulder and then a grassy meadow is what I thought. And um, so I'd see the picture and they'd be walking toward me and I'd think, there's a story there. And I had no idea what the story was, uh, but I knew these women looked like solidarity and there had to be more than uh, met the eye. So then in May of 2012, I attended the Women for Purdue event and it was a great two days. Uh, went with my friend Donna, who's right up there with workshops and sessions uh, about research and initiatives at Purdue. And Sally Watlington, Sally, mm -hmm. also attended. Now, I didn't know Sally either. 
honest people. But I overheard her talking about the deans, and my ears perked up. And I immediately remembered the photo of the five, and I thought, oh, she's talking about those women. And uh, Sally was like the daughter Helen Schliemann never had. And she said that she had been the chief chauffeur and the head gopher for the Deanie Weenies. <laughs> well, Sally had me no at respect. Deanie Weenies. Yeah, that's all it took. I heard that. And that was her endearing name for the four deans who spent their retirement years living on the same street, Western Drive in West Lafayette, and neighbors had nicknamed the street Dean's Row. So Sally called Betty the junior Deanie Weenie. So I was bold enough that day to say to Sally, I said, you know, the deans sound like a wonderful book, and I would love to write it. So I think she just looked at me like, if you know Sally, like she can look at you. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> she's like, who are you, woman? <laughs> yeah. and so, so I stalked her for the rest of the event. And, but, and aside, the Women for Purdue event this year is June 5th and 6th. And the Dean's Bible will be the common read for the women who attend, and Betty and I will hold a book discussion. So, Betty, can you continue this story yes. and tell about? Yes, <laughs> happy to do that. How did we connect on the Bible? Do you all remember June 12, 2012? That's the day the Board of Trustees met in Loeb Theater and voted on the new president. And you know, some of us were there in kind of a great day. And that afternoon, there was a reception at Ross Aid in Shively. And Dick and I were invited. And so we went and were kind of wandering around, visiting with people. And I looked across the room. And the, pres the new president was at one end of the room. There was this long line waiting to, to congratulate him and shake his hand. And I spotted Angie. and. I knew she was thinking about the deans and, and had some conversation about that. So I thought that it'd be nice to go over and say something. Approach Steve and Angie. And I think in that conversation, I mentioned that in the next week, the Bible was going to be given to the archives for safekeeping and preservation. And Angie asked about the Bible. You know, what's this secret Bible that's been floating around? You know, her pupils dilated, <laughs> and the, the rest of the room kind of faded away. I don't know where Steve and Dick went after that. Um, you know, here are the two of us just standing in the middle of the floor and all this stuff going around, and I'm telling her the story about the Bible. Neither of us, neither of us ever got to meet the president. <laughs> We have our priorities. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm sure he's a little miffed about that, that we would come and not get up there to see him. But you know, we just got so engaged in this next connection to what was going to, to become the book, The Dean's Bible. It, it worked. Yes. Well, and, she and we appreciate Bible. President Daniel so much <laughs> for providing this opportunity for us to get together and have that discussion. And what was your reaction to all of that, Angie? Well, I, I had cold chills when she said secret Bible. I thought, wow, there really is a story here. And, um, and I, also li I also knew immediately that was the name of the book, you know, that, yes. the Dean's Bible. It was so intriguing and mysterious. And because the word Bible, in lowercase, you know, has a double meaning, it means guidebook. And so um, while Carolyn Shoemaker's Bible is a Holy Testament, the Dean's Bible is biography and history and, in essence, a reference book because these women teach us so much about leadership, respect, equality, inclusion, and how women help other women uh, in a spirit of generosity. So their stories are very relevant today. So, Betty, you want to touch on the, uh, their contributions yes. for equality? You know, a major, major theme of this book is the, the whole civil rights movement. If somebody is a historian or uh, a sociologist, um, uh, political science, by reading this story about this group of people, you, you read the whole gamut of the last century civil rights movement. And you know, the telling is, is very interesting. And I'll give just one example from each one of the deans. 
Stratton signed on as a volunteer for the Second World War, Navy. She was quickly moved over to the Women's Auxiliary for the Coast Guard to be the leader, the first leader, named the SPARS. Well, if you know something about other military units, they were segregated. You know, men slept differently, they ate in different places, they had different jobs assigned to them. Not true for Dorothy. In a newspaper article at that time, she said, the Corps will make no distinction on the basis of color. All recruits will qualify on the same basis, train together, live in the same barracks, and perform the same type of jobs for the Coast Guard. Now, she made her statement firm that this was a different sort of place. And then we move to Schliemann, an example of her place in this whole civil rights movement. Some of you know that she started the SPAN plan program because of the women she saw here who came with husbands. The husbands were the ones taking courses, moving along on their degree, and the women had some low-paying clerical job. Husbands graduated, and my goodness, we have grown apart. And Helen said, there have to be ways to fix this. So the SPAN plan came out of that and a way to, for scholarships for student spouses to get funds to take at least one course and buy the book. You may also know that at one point, a Purdue graduate, a recent graduate, came to see Helen and said she'd been admitted to two other schools of veterinary medicine but she had been denied at Purdue because she was a woman. You can imagine how pleased Helen was with that. <laughs> so Helen visited with the president and then with the dean of the School of Veterinary Medicine, and that changed the formula. It was gradual, they weren't open, and as many women as qualified were in, but at least they started the process. And Carol Ecker, is the woman who was admitted to the vet school. And if you know, Carol went on to be a member of the Board of Trustees, have her own veterinary business, and became the first woman head of the State Veterinary Association. So it was a very good investment. Stone, very important. Purdue's Commission on the Status of Women. Enough rumblings were going on that finally John Hicks said, oh, heck. <laughs> you know, add the pres tell the president, just appoint Bev, we'll have this commission on the status of women and let's just kind of get on with this. So Bev chaired that group, 15 women, faculty and administrators. And we have with us today one of the members of that commission on the status of women, Betty Sudarth. Raise your hand, Betty. Yay! Yay! You know, at this campus, we love data, so you have to have a lot of that to convince anybody of anything. So <laughs> Be uh, Betty Sudarth was the statistician who served that committee, made a huge difference. Talk with her sometime. She has stories to tell that are very interesting. At the end of that experience, Bev was asked to make a presentation to the Purdue Women's Club about the conclusions from this study. Bev started by reading from children's letters to God. Dear God, are boys better than girls? I know you are one, but please try and be fair. <laughs> Love, Sylvia. Well, that commission was working hard to try to get God to be fair or the president or whatever. Barb Cook was in the right place at the right time when Title IX came on the scene. That was the legislation related to equal access to educational opportunities. We had lots of student organizations that were single sex. Mortar Board was single sex. Barb was the critical element that kept Mortar Board 
in discussion until they could make the decision that that would be open to men and women. So very, very important decision. Her professional organization also went through that. Barb was the, the linchpin that opened those organizations, kept them going. And Nelson, my piece in all of that, I was responsible for students with disabilities. I had just assumed that, been a, given that responsibility by Dean Stone. And I was told that that really doesn't take much time. Um, <laughs> This is easy. There were two students with disabilities on the campus who'd been identified. Both were blind. So I thought my responsibility was to take care of those two students. Well, the Rehab Act of 73 came into being, followed by ADA. And we have a campus that was lovely, classic, and not friendly to people with disabilities. So we had a real adventure, um, changing attitudes as much as anything else so that we had people willing to be cooperative and to understand why changes needed to be made. At one of the first national conventions I went to, a very wise fellow said, and this applies in a lot of ways, it's harder to change a university than to move a cemetery. <laughs> And you know, that's almost an understatement. Um, and we look at that from many different ways. So all of us were involved in the civil rights movement and I think made a difference in the kind of institution that we have today. Okay, so can, how are we doing on time? <laughs> We need to move along. Can we do our teasers? Yeah, we're going okay, to do we're our gonna teasers. Okay, we're going to give teasers. And these okay. are fast. Betty, go. All right. <laughs> we want to do this as a little scavenger hunt so that when you get your book, you know some things you need to look for and to kind of taunt you into reading this. So we're going to tease you into this. All right, question. What did Dorothy Stratton and Amelia Earhart talk about on Sunday nights when they had supper together over Dorothy's waffles. <laughs> you cheated, <laughs> Sally. Stop it. No, you have to figure out. You have to find out what it was. Okay. Angie. Which dean was like the character Scout in To Kill a Mockingbird? And what? how did the engineer Lillian Gilbreth influence Dorothy Stratton, who was not an engineer? Which dean helped start the liberal arts degree at Purdue as an experiment in 1937? And what did Helen Schliemann propose for women students in the late 1940s that almost got her fired and took another 20 years? You know that cemetery? It took another <laughs> 20 years for that to come about. Which dean asked every woman she knew, do you have your go to hell fund? And if you didn't, she would have a little conversation with you about why you needed to. And what is the punch in Dean of Women's Punch? And it's not apple juice or ginger ale. <laughs> what happened at an ice cream social in 1968 that turned the campus on its ear? And what happened the night after the 229 students were arrested in the Purdue Memorial Union? who had been involved in the lounge in. What happened the next night? And then, that same spring, what happened when the streaker went through the corridor of the <laughs> Purdue Memorial Union the night the Purdue Women's Club was having their annual dinner dance? Mine's really boring now, but which, <laughs> which dean was the national director of the Girl Scouts of America? <laughs> and which dean was known for being hip? And there's somebody in this room who knows firsthand about that. <laughs> Very good, yeah. What did Helen think about living together before marriage? And she told me that. You'd be amazed. You will learn about Helen's fabulous house that had glass from 
corner to corner, ceiling to floor, and an indoor pond. It was not an ordinary house. You'll learn about that. Which dean picked up hitchhikers? <laughs> Which two deans gave a bottle of whiskey as a get well gift to another dean? <laughs> Who called the police on the other four? <laughs> if the others haven't gotten you, this one will. <laughs> Which dean took on the challenge of adopting Captain Sally Watlington? <laughs> Learned the outcome of a class action suit filed by four professors and the Women's Caucus against Purdue and TIAA Cref. So the plot very, thickens. Very, very important to everybody in this room. <laughs> What's the significance of a set of handkerchiefs you will find in the exhibit? and ha they have embroidered Dean's names on them. What's the significance? And how do First Ladies Eleanor Roosevelt and Michelle Obama fit into the story? So, all right, we're about to end. I have one more yeah. question for Betty. But before that, uh, I want to offer everyone a lovely parting gift tonight. Another connection to the deans. Uh, I interviewed Purdue alumna Teresa Roach in Betty's Kitchen, as I did research. And Teresa couldn't be here tonight because she had a business commitment. But um, Teresa knew all of the deans and is especially close to Betty. And as we talked about the deans and as that they're stellar role models, uh, we discovered that we'd shared the same idea. We both had thought independently of one another about a bracelet that we could wear as a reminder of the integrity and strength of the deans. And when met with a professional or personal challenge, the bracelet would be a subtle prompt to think, what would dean of women do? <laughs> W-W-D-O-W-D. It just rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> so <laughs> Teresa was very kind to lead the charge of creating black unisex bracelets inscribed with W-W-D-O-W-D. And I happened to put one on right before I came up here, and this, <laughs> I needed the power of the deans. So uh, they're back here in a punch bowl that actually belonged to my mother, another thread of connection, because I dedicated the uh, book in memory of my mother, Rosemary Lip. So please take a bracelet on your way out. Um, so what would the dean of women do? That leads me to the last question, Betty. What do you think Dorothy, Helen, Bev, and Barb would think of the dean's Bible? Well, number one, they'd want Charles to have a bracelet. <laughs> Maybe two. <laughs> what would they think? Angie asked me that question about a month ago, and I paused a little bit and really had an instant image of how they would respond. They would be sitting around a glass top table in Helen's um, house on Western Drive, uh, near the pond, near that, that gurgling water, each of them would have read the book in detail, maybe twice. Uh. And they each would have a legal pad with lots of writing on it. There'd be at least four pages that each of them would have, and there would be things they would want to talk about. Now, why did Angie include this? And oh, why God. didn't Angie put <laughs> that in? And you know, I didn't see that quite that way. And you know, debate, debate, debate. And Dorothy, I'm sure, would have one little point. And you know, she even included that emerita instead of emeritus. And I've been after them for years about this. And finally, Barb would lean on the table and say, now, y'all, this is a really good book. I think Angie's done a fine job with this. And the rest would agree and say, yes, it's really wonderful. They just love to debate each other. <laughs> but they, I think there would be unquestioned agreement that this is a fine review of the impact of this line of deans on the Purdue community, I think maybe on the community at large, and on the larger global community as they've touched students and alums uh, around the world in some ways. So that's the five deans walking. It is. All right. All right. We're
We're going to take just three more minutes, and we're going to see a book trailer that was created by my son, Jack Klink, right here. Five women, a quest for equality, connected by a secret symbol, the Dean's Bible. Five leaders succeeded one another as Dean of Women and Dean of Students at Purdue University from the 1930s to 1990s. They passed down a Bible originally owned by Purdue's first Dean of Women. Stratton, Schliemann, Stone, Cook, and then Nelson. We were just, an, we were an anomaly in the country. Over the years I had seen this same photo of these five women at various Purdue functions. And I didn't know these women, but I would look at it each time I saw it, and they would be walking toward me, and I would think, there's a story. During World War II, Dorothy Stratton directed the Women's Reserve of the United States Coast Guard she named Spars. Helen Schliemann was her right-hand woman. Beverly Stone was a wave in the Women's Reserve of the Navy. Military experiences cemented the Dean's beliefs that women were capable of great accomplishments, even when society said otherwise. They encouraged female students, but were often thwarted by the male administration. I wanted to tell the stories of uh, Purdue women that have not been told. Each Dean was often the only female voice in a male-dominated uh, administration. Uh, but they were very courageous in speaking out for women students, for other women faculty, for those with disabilities, for anyone who was quote unquote different. The word Bible means guidebook. The Dean's Bible is just that. Brimming with stories of courageous women who led by example and lived their convictions. My hope is that the readers of the Dean's Bible will appreciate these women's stories because they worked so hard to encourage women students to fulfill themselves, to fulfill their capabilities, when society told them that a female education was not of value. It's fun to think about how the Deans would react to this. What they'd say is, we love the book. It was just wonderful to capture all of this legacy in one publication, you understood that you know this is about respect and equality and treasuring relationships. Um, you know, bravo! The author did well. I don't know about you, but I've got to go read that book to find answers to those questions. They are intriguing, especially that, what was the one that seemed particularly, oh, the, well, the booze one I know, that one I do know. Calling the police. Calling the police on them, yes, that's a good one. It, does the index indicate all of these where they are? No. Got to read the whole thing. Well, it's my pleasure now to honor and thank several individuals who helped make this book possible. But there's one person in particular who really helped make this possible through a significant contribution that made this book come to fruition on a much more quickly, or a much quicker schedule. And also to be able to keep the price down. So $20 for a book like this is a really good bargain. Uh, but it's uh, Captain Sally Waddlington. I want to acknowledge <laughs> I, I, I hesitate to speak for the deans, but I'm sure that they would say, job well done. So thank you so much. Now, it is my additional pleasure to present the 2014 um, award for an outstanding contribution to the Women's Archives. This is our third annual award. This was inaugurated in 2012 by the Women's Archives Development Council. 
The first award went to Sally Putnam Chapman for her gift of the George Palmer Putnam Amelia Earhart Collection. The second annual award was given to Susan Bulkley Butler for her inaugural gift to the Women's Archives, and in recognition of this, the important of this important first commitment, the Women's Archives name was changed to the Susan Bulkley Butler Women's Archives. This year, I'm pleased to announce the award for an outstanding contribution to Women's Archives goes to Dr. Mary Lou K. McEwen. And before Sammy Morris escorts Dr. McEwen to the stage to accept the award, I would like to provide you all some personal and professional highlights of Dr. McEwen's uh, career. Dr. Mary Lou McEwen <clears throat> is Associate Professor Emerita in the Department of Counseling, Higher Education, and Special Education at the University of Maryland, College Park. She received her BS degree in Mathematics from Purdue and her PhD in Counseling and Personnel Services from Purdue. Her teaching and research interests focused on student development theory, the apl applicability and enhancement of theories of student development for students of color, particularly Asian American students and African American students also white racial identity development and multiculturalism in student affairs and higher education. Her career included 12 years on the faculty at Auburn University and 21 years as a faculty member at the University of Maryland College Park. Her professional and personal, passion, personal passions began with an emphasis on women's issues and development and expanded to focus on diversity, multiculturalism, and social justice. She has continued to work with and mentor current and former students. Although she retired in June 2007, she has continued to work with graduate students and continues to stay engaged with many former graduate students. Now I'd like Sammy uh, Morris to escort Mary Lou to the podium here. I just want to say that um, in addition to the amazing support that um, Dr. McEwen has given to the Women's Archives, she also has donated materials that are in the exhibit, donated materials about her time as a student at Purdue, letters she wrote home her first semester here as a student, which are fascinating if you haven't seen them in the exhibit yet, as well as personal letters between her and many of the deans of women, deans of students. So it's a really fabulous collection that she's continuing to give, and we are very appreciative to her for that. And finally, her contributions don't end with the, op the obvious material or the materials that's, that Sammy just mentioned. Dr. McEwen is also make, making a $1 million planned commitment to uh, the Purdue Women's Archives. Trying a new approach with my iPad. <laughs> Betty's like, oh my. Um, now I'm just deeply honored with this recognition, and I want to thank the libraries and the archives. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, thank you, Sandy Howarth. Um, thank you, Sammy. Um, thank you, Becky Bunch, who's done all the planning for, or so much of the planning for the events. And Angie, congratulations to you on the book. I'd like to take a couple minutes and acknowledge um, some wonderful personal guests, um, some connected with Purdue and others from out of town who've joined me for this. Um, my really good friends, Karen and Jack Hammond, that I've known since we were in junior high in uh, West Central Illinois, who've come from Fairfax, Virginia. My friend Barbara Watts, who was a college friend of mine here at Purdue. Uh, Betty Nelson, who was a mentor of mine and is now a close friend. We've known each other more than 45 years. Um, and her husband, Dick. Uh, Sandy Monroe, who's been a friend for more than 35 years, and her husband, Jim Westman, and their son, Bryce Westman. Um, Ruth Randolph Rogers, and I there's Ruth, who was an Auburn student of mine, and we've known each other since the early 80s, I think. And Ruth is um, 
at Marion University in Indianapolis, uh, Susan Jones and Gretchen Metzlars, who are at The Ohio State University. And Susan was a doctoral advisee of mine, and Gretchen was a doctoral student, and they're both very good friends. Um, Jan Arminio, another doctoral advisee of mine, who's at George Mason University, and her husband, Tom. Um, Sally Watlington, who's a friend, and Elizabeth Liz Nuss, who's a professional colleague and good friend in Baltimore. So thank you all for coming. I'd like to make a few comments and probably a few more than um, maybe Becky wants me to make. But um, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to comment about the date and the year. Um, personally, it's interesting to me that this is March 19th. Um, this was my parents' wedding anniversary, so it's a, just a special date that um, my parents were married on this day. Also, 1914, um, uh, 2014 is interesting because 100 years ago today, um, at Teachers College, Columbia University, the first diploma of Dean of Women um, was offered. And so I think it's really interesting that this year marks the centennial of that. And both Dorothy Stratton and Beverly Stone hold degrees from Columbia University. So the connections continue. My attending Purdue was somewhat serendipitous. I had no relatives here, um, no friends who came here. I came here because I wanted to major in mathematics and it seemed like a good place. My experience here was transformative for me, but not in ways I had anticipated. I love my major in math and my minor in physics. However, I was the only woman in all my math courses and one of two women in my physics courses. My experience was that I had almost no interaction with my professors or with other classmates, except for the other woman in physics. I quickly learned there seemed to be no place for me in my major and my minor. Unfortunate, but that's how I felt. In the higher education literature, we now call this a chilly climate for women. <laughs> During my sophomore year, I was invited by an upper class student to become involved in Panhellenic. So along with my academic work throughout the remainder of my undergraduate experience at Purdue, I was engaged in several co-curricular activities. What I especially resonated with were the leadership opportunities for me as a woman at Purdue and the possibilities to work more closely with other women opportunities that unfortunately I did not have in my classes. It is there that I met Barb Watts, who's joined me today and who's my lifelong friend. My involvement in co-curricular activities, though, led to extraordinary opportunities, getting to know many of the staff of the Office of the Dean of Women, as they served as advisors to many student organizations. I got to know Babs Ellsbury, Celie Zisses, Linda Ewing, Bev Stone, Barb Cook, Betty Nelson, Helen Schleeman. The deans helped me to learn to think outside the box, to challenge the system, to think about what issues were worth fighting for and what ones to try to leave behind, to be an advocate, to be an activist, to be student-centered, to stretch my whole sense of myself, to let my soul be touched. I'd like to share a, a brief story. In 1968, Barb Watts and I had what we thought was a wonderful idea for student representation at the national level in national sororities. This was the era, after all, of student protests and students gaining representatives on university committees and boards of trustees. We shared our elaborate paper and idea with Dean Stone, 
who marched us right into Helen Schleeman's office. She suggested to Helen that Helen could get us on the agenda of the National Panhellenic Conference Women Deans Coordinating Committee at the Women Deans National Conference in Chicago that April. Helen said, of course, she would work on that. And in a matter of days, it seemed, Helen had arranged for Barb Watts and me to attend that conference and present our idea. I don't think it went over so well with the national sorority leaders. <laughs> But what I learned is that Beverly Stone and Helen Schleeman would advocate for students and they knew how to advocate and how to use their power. There are other lessons I learned. From Betty Nelson, I learned about listening and attentiveness and later about advocacy for students with disabilities. From Bev Stone, I learned about compassion when I was in my master's program at Indiana University, I did go to that other school for a while, <laughs> I, I visited with Bev and she drove me around campus in her Buick. <laughs> You'll appreciate that, Susan Jones. And then we stopped somewhere in her car to talk privately. Bev started sobbing about how difficult it was, her dilemmas in working with administration through that era of student protests, upholding Purdue's policies, yet finding students well-intended and thoughtful. She talked about her joys and her challenges in working with students and what she learned from them and with them. From Dorothy Stratton, whom I met much later in her life and in mine, I learned that she cared about research and scholarship she always asked me what my students were researching and what I was researching. And then she had ever so many questions about whatever I told her. <laughs> From Barb Cook, I learned humility and daring to support students who did not su have support from the university and administration as a whole, such as Barb's work with the Lesbian and Gay Student Alliance, I also learned about Barb's love and appreciation of history and context. Barb did try to teach me about gardening and names of a few plants, but I don't think I ever learned that, and she was deeply disappointed. <laughs> what is amazing to me about my Purdue experience is that more than 45 years later, it continues. Four of the deans have passed on, but they remain in my hearts and the many lessons of all five deans stay with me. They were and are women of integrity who cared deeply for students and for Purdue University, who stood up for what was right and who advocated for social justice. It is such a pleasure and a great privilege to be connected with the deans and now with the, women, now with the women's archives so that the legacy of women at Purdue and in the state of Indiana will live on. Thank you to all my friends who've joined me today. And thank you again, Jim, Sammy, Sandy, and others at the libraries for this recognition. It's really an honor to be with you all here. Thank you. small token uh, to, to hand to Mary Lou to, to remind you of the concern and care and love that we have for you here at Purdue. Oh. And this is something that you will, I'm sure, put in a very prized place. I will. I will. I have and a perfect this place. This comes from um, the, the um, here in Lafayette, doesn't it? Yes. Inspired Fire? Inspired yes, fire. Inspired Fire. So it's me right here <laughs> locally. locally. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you.
<laughs> well, that's the end of our program this evening. And there's still food left. And, uh, and I know that there's a lot of people here that would love to have conversations in smaller groups to be able to talk to Betty and to Mary Lou, to Angie, to, to talk about the experience that they've had both in living at Purdue for the last 40 some years, but also the whole experience of the, the women's deans. And thank you all very much and look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you.